Good evening. Welcome to Expat Insights. I'm your host Raju Mandhian. Here at Expat Insights, we take external views of internal successes by foreigners, expats and immigrants who are doing good in the Philippines, either in business or society. Tonight, our guest is from a great country. He is a chartered engineer in the oil and gas, gas industry for the last 20 years, former asset manager of Malampaya, Philippines, managing director of Shell Philippines, a former trustee at the British School of Manila, and now a chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce, our guest, Mr. Keith Perrin. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Expat Insights. Thank you very much. So uh, tell us about what brought you to the Philippines, Mr. Perrin. Okay. As you just said, I've been in the oil and gas business all my life, most of that with Shell. Um, and that normally goes that you work four years in one country, get moved on, four years in another country, move on. And in 2001, I was in the UK uh, after 13 years before that in overseas, looking for a new assignment. And it was my lucky time because the assignment that I was managed, managed to get was the startup and operation of Malampaya, which is a jewel in the crown for the Philippines and the Philippine government. And I'll happily tell you about that project uh, later if you wish. But it's, uh, I came out here at very short notice to be part of the startup and have been here ever since. And my four-year assignment became five years and became six years because I was enjoying it so much. Finally became eight years. Then I finally retired from Shell and from the business. Uh, and you plan year. to make this country your home? Yes, I have a retirement visa here now, so this will be my home until we decide otherwise. Tell us about your first imp impressions about the Philippines when you came here. Yeah. Did you have any other island experiences before coming to Manila? It's amazing how little the Philippines features on the British agenda. It's yeah. mainly an uh, American uh, asset in the past. Yeah. So I knew nothing about the Philippines at all. But that's, it's not the first time I've been, to a, I've been sent to a country that I knew nothing about, so it didn't really hold much of a uh, fear Challenge, for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I enjoy working in new cultures. New, I've worked in Europe several times. I've worked in Africa, the Middle East. Never worked in Asia, so this was a great opportunity to be involved in both in Asia and also with this fantastic project. Any, any differences between these other countries that you lived and worked in that were outstanding for you about the Philippines? Um, the people, I think. Um, I think we're going to talk about the, the English in a moment, but yeah. uh, the, the thing that the English have lost, I think, is the respect and the family values, and I see that in spades here. It's, it's fantastic to see it still alive and, alive and kicking, and it basically makes the Filipinos what they are. All right, and good. I so give us a little, uh, paint us a picture of the English people. I mean, you know, the English people kind of appear distant and cold and tall and far away. Give us a picture. Make them yeah. real for us. Okay. It's important to distinguish between English and British. Sometimes I say I'm British. Sometimes I say I'm English. Oh, I thought it was Sometimes the same I thing. say I'm European, and they're different. Um, I am a former member of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, probably the longest title of any country you've ever get to. United, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Great Britain consists of Scotland, England and Wales. Oh, Northern Ireland's oh, on top okay, of that. Okay. So, so, so I'm Scottish, now British. Irish and English people are British. British. Oh, okay. But, and being an island race, I mean most cultures are uh, a function of their history and geography. Mm -hmm. Being an island race in the years gone by, we've been used to being attacked by everybody and therefore become the French. very French. The, <laughs> the Germans, the, the Vikings, the Celts, the, you name it. The Gaels. When, when you say the Gaelish people are... Ga Gaelish. Yeah. Celts, I was saying. The Celt Scottish, yeah. 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 Um, so it's an island race and that, that determines the type of people we are. Okay. But I tried to do some research on this because um, the, the culture of the, Brit of the English, I'm saying it myself now, British, the English, uh, has changed considerably over the years. If you went, tried to define what a, an English guy was like or girl was like, maybe 30, 40 years ago, it would be fairly straightforward. We were. I think it was um, uh, a function of the history um, because... Um, the empire. The empire, mm -hmm. clearly. Um, we've been used to ruling the world uh, from a very small country. It's fantastic to, to think that such a small country could have spread its wings so much to, uh, to take over I think about a quarter of the land mass of the world was... was well, my was country, you guys took over my country <laughs> for the longest time. Um, so there's a lot of pride in that. 
it also generated um, a public culture, public school culture as well, where so many Englishmen were s and their wives were sent abroad to r run these countries. They left this, the kids in schools in the UK, in England. Public and, uh, school cultures. Can public school, know? yeah. Um, it's a it's the wrong term because public school in England means private schools. Oh, okay. Boarding schools, so many children went to boarding schools so their parents could go overseas. Okay, okay. Um, so diplomacy was a key feature of, of British. Yeah, of the last century. Of the last century. Yeah. Um, very formal. Mm -hmm. um, and an obsession with tea, with cricket, with the weather, and all beer. these things. And beer. In the pubs. Warm yeah. beer. Warm, Warm beer. beer, okay. One of the famous sayings of one of our Prime Ministers, John Major, was that uh, when he was hoping we'd go back in time to the way it used to be, was that we, he thought we should go back to uh, cricket and warm beer, which defines a typical English gentleman. And so I've just a very I, boring game, and I, not I would, exciting a drink. <laughs> uh, I love warm beer, <laughs> I love cold beer here, yeah. but I love cricket as well. I've just come back from Australia watching uh, three days of the uh, last Ashes Test, which was a fantastic uh, opportunity for me. So it's still, it's still there, and yeah. people, there are people who will happily sit and watch a game that lasts five days for eight hours at a time. Yeah? Nothing, happened. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. Talking about beer, is it true that there's a law in England, not uh, United Kingdom, that you can drink in a pub but not get drunk? Is that a law? I wish it were. No, it's <laughs> not. Definitely not. In fact, one of the... Uh, the sad things about the country now is that um, the licensing laws only allowed you to drink between certain times. So that pr promoted a culture where everybody was getting drunk in the last half an hour of the, the opening time. What are these hours? Oh, I think that it's probably till 10, 11 o'clock so at night, but now it. pubs are allowed to stay open if they oh, get okay, a license yeah. longer. Yeah, I remember that. I was in L London one time. But that's one thing I notice in my country, that mm. there is a lot of drunkenness around uh, in the streets, and I don't see much of that. Here. In the Philippines? No, no you don't. Okay. Even though the price of alcohol is a lot less <laughs> so than it is in the in UK. So the, the, the modern day so English person, uh, how different is he from yeah, the English person a hundred years ago? I think um, it's no longer England as it used to be because yeah. there's been a lot of uh, immigration from yeah. uh, first of all, from the West races, Indies, yeah. from India, Pakistan, yeah, Bangladesh, yeah, yeah, yeah. now European yeah. countries as well. Mm -hmm. So the whole culture has been diluted now. Correct. And the English find their, their sovereignty and their power base being slowly eroded. Yeah. Um, so there isn't, I don't think there's a typical Englishman now. I mean, there's a personal view. I'm sure if you interviewed another Englishman here, you get a different view of, of that. But yeah, okay. I've seen a changes in my lifetime between this sort of respectful, right. formal right. culture yeah. to now, not much different from any other culture. I think the, the humor is the one thing that defines the British though. It's a very satire, irony, humor rather Actually, than slapstick. Actually, I don't understand any of it, <laughs> <laughs> except for Mr. Bean and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's probably not typical. No, it's really yet. classy humor. I'm kidding yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, yeah, many people have difficulty understanding British humor because we yeah. laugh at things and you know, people say, well, what are you laughing about? So yeah. before, we, we, we could, we'll come to a break and we'll come and talk about Malampaya and mm -hmm. energy and the British in this country. But could you, for like about 30 seconds, paint a picture of your childhood growing up in old England? Mm. Okay. Well, a I was memory, a, a story. Yeah. Okay. I was a baby boomer, which means I was born after the war when couples were allowed to get together again right, because they right. weren't fighting a, a war. Being born, yeah. um, so it was a very poor childhood because my father was cut off in his prime of life because he was uh, fighting in the, in the war, right, so he right, didn't, right. couldn't have a career. So he came right. back very poor. My yeah. family was very poor. My, yeah. I was an only child. Yeah. So I lived in a council house in a small uh, town in, in Kent. I uh, went to the local grammar school. This is not in the city of London? No, it's about uh, an hour's drive out of London. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm now trying to research my family background. And Find your roots. My roots. Yeah. And uh, it's fascinating to think my mother watched the Battle of Britain from her backyard. Oh, my God. Watching planes falling out of the sky. And it was, you know, that, so the whole war is, is a thing that's, that's really, etched, really in etched in my memory because yeah. it's etched in theirs as well. Great, oh. uh, sir, uh, Mr. Perrin, we'll take a break. Okay. We'll take a one-minute break and we'll come back and we'll talk about the British and the Philippines and Malampaya. Okay. Stay with us. We are with Mr. Keith Perrin of the British Chamber of Commerce and this is Expanding Science. I'm your host, Ron Jumand here.
Welcome back to Expanding Science. I'm your host Raju Manti and we are still with Sir Keith Perrins of the British Chamber of Commerce and uh, we'll talk to him about Malampaya and the energy industry in the Philippines. So Keith, can you tell us what Malampaya is? I know it's been around for 10 years but can you repaint the picture? I guess those of you that were in the Philippines in the 90s will remember the brownouts that were happening quite regularly. During Ramos time, that's correct, yeah. That was because the power generation could not match the demand. Correct, yeah. And uh, it was very fortunate for the Philippines that in 92, I think, uh, a huge gas field was found offshore El Nido in Palawan. Yeah. In very deep water, yeah. 800 meters of water depth. And the gas field is then another two kilometers into the sea. The ground, okay. Um, Who found this? Uh, uh, Oxy found it, Occidental found it. Okay. And then various farm ends and various companies got together to, to try and develop it. But this was a, in fact, I was involved in that in, when I was in The Hague. 92? In, in 92. Yeah. One of my team came out here to do the first Where assessment. Where were you at that time? In The Hague, in Holland, in our Shell's head office there. Okay, okay, yeah. We did little investigations to see, okay, we found some gas or some oil somewhere. Right. How right, can we make right, this right, uh, right. a going concern? And I remember him coming back saying, do you realize they found this huge gas field in the middle of nowhere, yeah. an environmentally sensitive area, with the subsea mountain ranges between the gas and the beach. What does that mean? Uh, uh, well, the mountains on the seabed. It's not a flat seabed, it's an actual mountain range. And what the does pipe, that so do? the pipeline has to run across this mountain oh, range okay, to get so to the shore. Oh, okay, so you have to dig through, yeah. And, uh, and then if you get the gas to shore, there's no customer. Yeah. So it was one of those, well, this is nev never going to happen. Yeah. So it was incredible for me that 10 years later, I'm out here to start up what I thought would never actually happen in the first place. Yeah. It took 10 years to get all the political, commercial, technical agreements from 92 way up to, to 2000 2001 so you had to go through two administrations and uh, during that time um, the last four years was the part that I remember most which was the construction of the facility which consists of five wells with this is in the early part of 2000 97 it took okay, four years the latter part so of the last millennium okay the project started in 97 design yeah. all in various parts of the world yeah um, this was a the offshore part, the Shell Chevron Pino Sea part, yeah. was a $1.6 billion investment. Yeah. If you include three On the part of Shell? With the partners, yeah. It yeah. wasn't all Shell. Yeah. And that paid for the design of and c construction of three w uh, five wells on the seabed. Yeah. A 500 kilometer pipeline to Batangas across. Very From Palawan to Batangas, okay. To Batangas. A gas receiving facility at Batangas. Yeah. Um, and a, a platform offshore sitting on a concrete structure. This is in Batangas? In no, the platform is in Palawan. Okay, okay. And um, all that was, was put together and commissioned in 2001. And is in that time, uh, there was no gas in the fuel mix for the, for the Philippines. For uh, power generation. Power generation. Yeah. It was all, well, the, the fuel mix in the Philippines is basically, uh, base load is geothermal, where you pump hot water down into hot rocks, right. hot water down into hot rocks, and then it comes back and generates steam, which drives turbines. Yeah, yeah. There's hydro when, when it rains, so that's dams filling up with water, which are right, through turbines. Right, right. That maybe represent 15, 20% of the total slate. Yeah. The rest, before Malampaya, was either coal-fired power stations or, or oil-fired or oil yeah. power stations. Yeah. Then along came Malampaya with really God's gift of the Philippines, I think, because okay, this yeah, is, uh, so it, yeah. is now representing half of the energy demand for Luzon from this right. one gas field. So put it into context, one in every two light bulbs in this studio. In Luzon or just all over Philippines? Luzon. Okay, Luzon alone. Is yeah. now being powered by this uh, gas field. So, so uh, Visayas and Mindanao is not yet uh, they, so are, they are separate. There are small connections, but they're not, mm -hmm. not, enough. not enough to yeah. power everybody. So um, that's what we, we got. And um, uh, then we have to keep this thing going to make money. Yeah, of course. And once it's going, it has to be reliable because once you've created the extra capacity, then the demand can start Catch growing up again. It, yeah, yeah. And that's a situation now where the demand has Increase. about caught up with the capacity supply side, yeah, yeah. So w the country is now desperately in need of more capacity to allow this um, increase to uh, to be met. 
Um, so the benefits of Malampaya are that it's an indigenous source, so we right. don't have to import right. gas. Yeah. We have to import coal, we have to import oil. Yeah. So it, it avoids um, uh, foreign exchange going out of the country to pay for these right. Um, right. imports. It makes us money, it saves us money, yeah. It's a very big money spinner for the government right. in terms of taxes and revenues. Right. It's a great employer of people and resources here. Yeah. Um, one of the things I remember most about the early days of Malampire was where do you get the people to operate this thing? Because you didn't have the, tec uh, the technical technology skill. The the technology does yeah. not exist in, in the Philippines because this is the first and only gas field of its kind in the whole right. country. So that so time you brought in a lot of expats when you came in. Yes. Well, first of all, we had uh, when I first arrived, we had about 60 expats here. Right. They okay. were the, the re re leftover of the project team that built the, pro the facility and right, the new right. operating team yeah. to operate yeah. it. But the heart of it were Filipinos that were working overseas in the oil and gas business. Oh, so the we OFWs. Managed to, we managed to attract them back. Wow. Um, because they saw this as maybe the only time in their career they were able to pride. get a job in their, in their own country. <laughs> yeah. And it gave them pride to work on the, the yeah, prestigious asset yeah. in, in, this, in this country. Yeah. And w because Shell became reorganized as well, uh, we organized on a regional basis. So for the first time, the Philippines started to see what the operation for Shell was like in Malaysia and in Brunei and China. And You've got a very global perspective to what was happening here. And it, it was great because the Filipinos then, for the first time, became exposed to the world at large for Shell and became a, a sought-after resource. So from being almost off the radar screen to suddenly, well, we didn't realize that Philippines that could do this. That there's skill here. So yeah. we became, in fact, um, a training ground for, for for Filipinos to go overseas and we've started exporting oh. talent now to yeah. all over the world so it's been a great challenge for us a to do that. A couple of questions on my mind. Uh, Occidental you mentioned is the company that discovered that there's gas in Palawan. No? Yes. How, how does one discover that there's gas under the ocean? What are the, what are the steps? Okay. Could there be a chance that we could find gas somewhere else in the rest of the Philippines? There is exploration going on all the time yeah. in the Philippines, yeah. um, uh, and everybody hopes that somebody will find another Malampaya gas field because that will then oh. fuel the next uh, wave of uh, demand. It will become a richer country. But yeah. there are very clever exploration geologists that try to look at s subsurface maps. You may have heard of seismic. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's a very sophisticated s uh, resource where you basically, uh, offshore, you tow um, little detonation devices and and receivers across the sea and, and the behind sound boats coming back tells bounce you. waves off the rocks two kilometers down right, right. and from that you're trying to find a, a dome shaped structure yeah. with a uh, seal rock the rock that gas cannot penetrate through yeah um, and then having done they call two-dimensional seismic that gives you a broad scope of what where you may find these these structures. Uh, then elements. you go in and look in 3D, which is a much more detailed analysis wow. of that area. Wow, wow. But the only sure way of finding whether there's oil, gas, or water in those reservoirs is by drilling a well there. <laughs> and in deep water, a well can cost $100 million. And then you still don't have no guarantee you find something. <laughs> in fact, Malampaya, I remember, had three wells before it found the Malampaya gas field. And uh, I still remember the discussions in The Hague at the time. Can you imagine, at the time, this is 92, they drilled one well which cost $40 million in 92 money, so it's probably $100 million now, found nothing. This was in? 92. Yeah, no, but what? what in what? Malampaya, yeah, Malampaya okay, this yeah, is the yeah. history of Malampaya. And, uh, and then the discussion, okay, we'll try one more time. Yeah. Another $40 million right, in 92 right. money found a little bit of oil, I think. Yeah. And then I remember the discussion then, so do we now invest in a third well and risk yeah. having spent $120 million and got nothing back for it? Right. Or the prospect of finding a gas field, and they found Malampire gas field, and the, and the rest is history. Right. And the oil and gas business is taking that sort of risk all the time mm -hmm. to try and um, find what, find it before somebody else does. By um, world standards, how huge is Malampaya? How big is it? Where does it rank in terms of gas exploration? Um, well, it's a reservoir that will feed between 30 to 50 percent of Luzon's energy demand for 23 years. Huge. Yeah. 
I, mean, yeah. I, won't, I won't bore you with the numbers because it won't mean anything in contact, but it yeah. is a very big gas field yeah. um, and very unusual because there's nothing else anywhere near it that's been found yet. So the geologist will tell you that there's a good chance if you find one, there's another one somewhere, but how you find it is another matter and who's prepared to invest that sort of money to, uh, to make sure they get it. How many Filipinos uh, did Malampai and Shell employ since then and how many do they employ currently? Yeah, the, the oil and gas business is very capital intensive and not very labor intensive. Okay. You, you need a lot of people to build this thing, but you don't need many to operate it. Right. In fact, the whole of Shell Philippines is only 160 people, um, of which now I think there are about 20 expats. The in the are, exploration? No, in, in the operating phase. Right. Um, the the Malampaya gas field is operated and managed by about 160 people now only. Right. Um, so it. But it's not just the facility itself. We have many contractors. We have maintenance contractors. We have logistics contractors. Distributors. Catering. You need all the resources that go with a, any, um, any operation. And um, so it is employing indirectly quite a lot more people than that. Your impression, uh, you're, you're, you're having to adjust to the Filipino culture after having come down to Europe. How have you adjusted and what are the good sides to it? Hmm your management style, your leadership style, how has it shifted in the last so many years? Yeah, it was here? quite a, a shock to start with because uh, the, the trend in Europe now yeah. is to try and dumb down hierarchy. Yeah, flatten it. Flatten it so yeah. that the, the boss is part of the <laughs> game. Of the game yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's also one where you try to give positive, constructive feedback to each other as well. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, yeah. to be called Sir Keith was a big problem for Sir me to Keith, start with. Yeah, yeah, Sir you Keith, did it yourself right just Sir now. Keith, yeah. To have um, hierarchy emphasised, people here like to have, Please I'm the boss and you're yeah. there and you're <laughs> down there. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> we, we tried to institute like our Western culture in Malampaya, in the Call Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to try and raise people's prestige and their own self-worth self yeah. mm -hmm. um, to what, the, what it should be. Mm. And I remember w there was um, a, f a, a feedback s system w which we introduced in UK called 360 Feedback, where you, you, you get your bosses and your subordinates your and your customer, peers yeah. to give you feedback on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on your style and your yeah. <coughs> where you're going, where you're doing well and mm -hmm. where you're And I remember when I first tried to launch that here, I thought I'd better just check it out on a few Filipinos, first yeah. of all, to see how it would yeah. Yeah. Uh, rather than just come in with a mm -hmm. new broom and start uh, mm -hmm. introducing a whole lot of things that weren't going to work. Mm -hmm. I said, well, how would you feel if, um, if I told you that um, you know, from your peers you're pretty good at these things and you're excellent at that, but there's one thing I would like, I would like uh, one thing I do you think you need some help on? Yeah. How would you feel about that? And he came back straight, straight away to me and said, um, I'd ignore all the good stuff, I'd focus okay. on the bad stuff, I'd dwell on it forever, and I'd probably withdraw from you. Yeah. I'm going, whoa, okay. <laughs> Resign. I need to uh, try and uh, coach this in a in a much right, more positive right, way. Right. But we did do it, and certainly the the younger ones would want to take That's this on because they yeah. want to learn from the their the Western their culture. Western That's what the show is all about. Yeah, and yeah. we're we're trying very hard. But our role here is to train Filipinos, not just to manage the technical part, but to manage the company and to do all the things that are well, right. I do hear and that now there are much more Filipinos in Shell and Malampaya compared to how it was many years ago. In yes. fact, I met a few of them and they said, we are all Filipinos now. So they were a bit very proud of this. Well, one of the, when I was managing director until I retired uh, 18 months ago, yeah. um, my number two was a finance director who was a Dutch guy. Yeah. And um, we've now both been replaced by Filipinos, which mm -hmm. is what we're here for. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's a real success well, to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'll just go back to the cultural thing again because... Go back to the English, okay. <laughs> English and the Dutch. Okay. I probably will upset all the, the Dutch people that are listening here, but yeah. we are a, a, an unholy mix because Shell is English and Dutch. We are totally different. Right. Dutch, excuse me, Dutch. Dutch yeah. are much more direct. They go right. from here to here, there's a straight line. The, Brit, right. the, the English will go, well, we'll do this and we'll... we'll they will, we'll, they will, okay. We'll finally get there. And that was fantastic because depending on the sort of management issue, 
they'd either wheel me out if it was a, well, a nice soft issue, or it would, we'd read the Dutch guy out if it was a direct, no, we're not, we're doing it this way. He'll pick the king. He could take the, he'll be the bad guy. He'll be the stick. And then I'll be the good guy that goes in afterwards to, yeah. uh, to tidy up. <laughs> and it worked the treat. Yeah? Yeah. So it does show that different cultures can bring different things to uh, the, a company. The rest of the English community, let's, sh should we talk about the English or the British now? Uh, English. Up to you. English. The rest of the English community <laughs> in this country, because you had the British Chamber, I usually, I always thought it was the same, one and the same thing. But the rest of the English community, what kind of business are they in, and what is the culture of the, the Englishman here in the Philippines? What are they doing here, and what what, what kind of life do they live? Mm. Totally different from yeah. living in England. Yeah. And I think, like myself now, I've been out of, the out of my own country so long now, yeah. it would be very difficult to go back. Yeah. Our values and our experiences are just mm -hmm. so wildly different. So, um, expat communities differ world over as well. Yeah. This is one of the best I've seen. I've lived in remote places and I've lived in Lagos and in Doha and places where it's a totally different world. But there is always a core of people that you yeah, get on with. This is a special kind of a paradise, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And in very difficult countries, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real help because you become a very close-knit community because there's right. this you know, difficult world out there that you yeah. want to share together. Here is not nowhere near as hard as that for foreigners to live in, in Manila. Um, but I've just moved from Alabang, where my office was, yeah. to now a freelance, if you like, living in, uh, near Makati. It's like a new <coughs> thing for me. We're now a different circle of friends and different things to do. Um, and we, we meet each other very, very often. The Chamber of Commerce, which we'll talk about later on, yeah. is a great way of meeting people and continuing to make networks and contacts. In the, in the British Chamber of Commerce, what kind of businesses are most commonplace? I mean, are they all into, uh, what kind of industry are they in? What's the uh, setup? Oh. In the chamber, we have two, just over 200 members, both corporate members and individual members, mostly mm -hmm. corporate, big companies, small companies, startups, um, and individuals. Whole range from energy to BPOs to finance to banks to you know, everything. Um, and a few, we have a premier membership as well, which are the, the biggest companies that pay more to us for that privilege and get more exposure. Um, but it's a, it's a a club that's designed to give information and opportunities for British companies or companies with British management to come yeah. together yeah. to either start up, mm -hmm. you know, maintain or grow their businesses by providing opportunities for that, like networking events, we do advocacy, we do... You know, we also do some of forecasting of what the future looks like for the British in the Philippines? A little bit, yeah, because we, our office is in the British Embassy, mm -hmm. so we work very closely with the UK Trade and Investment Office, yeah. who are doing similar sorts of things from a more formal British government standpoint. We have an office there, but we're basically independent of, of them. Here in the Philippines. But we're all in the same business. We're trying to help British businesses succeed in the Philippines by giving them guidance and off, you know, benefit of our experience. All right, so Keith, let's take a one-minute break. Yeah, we're okay. going to come back and we'll come and talk about the future of the British in the Philippines and what the Filipinos are doing with the British in UK. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so we'll take a one-minute break and we'll come back with Sir Keith. This is Expat in Science. I'm your host, Roger Mandian. Please stay with us. I'm your host, Roger Mandi, and we're still with Sir Keith Perry of the British Chamber of Commerce, and he is right now telling us about 
what the other British nationals are doing in the Philippines and about the British Chamber of Commerce. So uh, Sir Keith, give me another picture on what HSBC is doing, what Standard and Chartered is doing, how much, uh, uh, how much good they're doing to the Filipino community and how. Yeah, I know you had a, a session on corporate social responsibility CSR, recently, yes, CSR yes. with uh, Camilla yeah. recently, and who's one of the directors of BCC now? Yeah, she is indeed a good friend of mine, and yeah. um, we are trying to help smaller companies understand what CSR means to them by using the experiences of big companies. Well, that's nice. Yeah. And um, uh, we have a, a new program starting up uh, this year to try yeah. and uh, do, to do that. I'll talk about that later on. This is the Chamber of Commerce doing British it Chamber for. Of Commerce to try and promote this and yeah, to try and get people together on certain themes throughout wow, the year. Yeah. Um, I've had obviously a lot of experience with, with Shell's activities yeah. and um, I must say that without taking any of the credit because it was all in place before I arrived but yeah. this is the best CSR campaign I've ever seen in, uh, in my life in, yeah. in Shell. Yeah. And it's trying to do different things. It's trying to help the communities that we are, are affected by our operations, mm -hmm. but also to avoid, on the real hard-nosed end, to avoid any unrest that would might uh, jeopardize those facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and this particular activity for Malampire did win some sort of international awards for, being for, you, yeah, for, yeah. Uh, for doing it the yeah. right way. And it's, it's all about getting into the community and understanding what their needs are rather yeah. than you determining that they need a school or they need a water well or they need whatever. They, they, they work it out themselves right. and you help them spend the money in a wise way and not just hand over money that could be used for anything. Not just charity, yeah. And all the big companies are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, we are still involved in it from the chamber as well and yeah. personally too to try yeah. and uh, give something back and get involved because I've been involved in quite a lot of the fallouts from um, Ondoy, for example. There's, right. a, there's a group of expats that get to, used to get together after Ondoy to help. responding to crisis. Yeah, helping yeah. Um, yeah. people and getting, it's a good team building event as well for yourselves. It's great to get out and do something useful with your time. Yeah. These small companies that you're trying to help, that you're trying to instill the values of CSR in them, these are just expat companies or Filipino companies? Mostly or British or companies that don't have the resources or, or the know-how. The know yeah. um, it's not just CSR, it's um, integrity, how to avoid, how to get uh, compliance, how to, how right, to, yeah. how to, to do business properly. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to set our stall out as being, this is how you should do it, and now mm -hmm. we'll try and encourage you to do it and give you tr help if mm. that we can, either through the British Chamber or trying to get other companies that will offer that support to the smaller what companies. What are the too. most outstanding CSR initiatives of Malampai or Shell in, uh, that you have done or that you've been part of? Again, it's not the most creative me. one. Yeah. The most creative one was um, eradication of malaria in Palawan. Right. Palawan is the closest island, or a uh, big island yeah, to our no. operation, and uh, malaria was pretty endemic there, and many people were dying from it every year. Yeah. And it's a real success story because um, uh, what the Malampaya Consortium did was to provide microscopes to allow technicians to, to take samples of blood to put yeah. under the microscope to see yeah. the little yeah. Um, yeah. bugs and train s uh, one or two people in each barangay to barangay, operate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then because these barangays are so remote, they had no power. Mm -hmm. Even though they're close to Malapai, they have no electricity themselves. So we then put shell solar panels in each of these barangays. So you have at least a light bulb, a microscope and a trained employee wow, wow. to okay. analyze. So if somebody became sick, they could get the sample taken, analyze it. If it was malaria, they could. They would then be on their way to whatever the hospital treatment they would be. How successful or has this mission? I been? think it's virtually almost eradicated malaria in those areas now. There's a right. light bulb in every barangay in Palawan now. Yeah. And it was so successful that the World Health Organization has now leveraged the asset, the money that we put in, yeah. and made a big donation. I think it's 12 million dollars right. to try and do this in a bigger scale in the Philippines now. Wow. So it's wow. A, a small thing. Started well worked and is now right. a way to try and treat some malaria. It also pays for um, nets and uh, the, the stuff that keeps the mosquitoes at bay and so on. Mm. So it's an all-round program that has made that saved lives. Yeah. Besides, besides CSR initiatives of uh, Malampai and Shell and other, Br other British nationals, how is the uh, bilateral trade here and what is, what kind of investments are the English people making in this country and what would the uh, yeah, uh, incite you or invite you to invest more. The bigger picture, yeah. 
Yeah, I read somewhere recently that um, the UK has the biggest in, in, in Europe of, of the trade yeah. Uh, yeah. investments. Um, <coughs> the thing that m makes it happen is what we are as a chamber trying to preach all the time, which is yeah. uh, um, uh, sanctity of contract, um, it eliminate bribery and corruption, and um, create a, a, a fair playing field for all companies to compete on a fair basis. Mm -hmm. And I think all the chambers will be trying to preach yeah. the same, mm -hmm. same thing. Um, we, we try and help companies negotiate their way through the legislation and through the, um, the hurdles they have to get over to set up a business here. It's not easy because the, the, the embassies are all doing that for their own yeah. kinds as well. Um, but it, it is it's where we can add value because we businessmen that have been here for a long time know what you can and can't do and how to do it the best way to get things done. When I, I've been very fortunate working for a big company because the rules are extremely clear. You, mm. you, you, know, you get involved in yeah. brown envelopes and you are fired. It's simple mm -hmm. as that. Yeah. There are various shades of grey all the way through the uh, right. companies here yeah. and we're trying to promote this as the way forward, mm -hmm. as, as difficult as it may be for some of them. Uh, Simon Fraser, Under Secretary of the State British Foreign Office, and he said that uh, they need more stability in this country and that would make it much more um, exciting for British nationals to invest. Is that uh, your opinion too or the opinion of other British nationals in this country? I think so, yes. Businesses don't like surprises. They like to know what they're going to be letting themselves in for and make sure that they are putting all this effort and resource in and getting something out of it at the end of the day. Um, so it's what we're trying to generate. I mean, I'll, I'll put a plug in for another thing that's not part of the British Chamber, but we're obviously supporting it. There's been a thing called Arancada. What's that? It's a large document put together by a group of a consortium. Arancada? Means accelerate, I think, which is a... I, I, I don't know that much Tagalog. <laughs> Arancada um, means uh, acceleration? Okay. And um, it's a document involving lots of um, consultants, helping and consultants consulting individuals and organizations. So what is it that need the Philippine needs to do? Wow. If, you, if you were the new president, yeah. what should you do to help all these areas? And yeah. uh, it's, a, it's, I think there are 400 odd recommendations, which has now been given to the president to, to uh, by this organization. Uh, the various chambers have been involved wow, in it. Wow, wow. Um, and it's like free consultancy to the government, saying these are the issues that we've analysed, these are the things that you think we think you should do and focus your mind on. And it needs to accelerate that pace of implementation of those ideas. You so see the new, new administration of the, the new Aquino administration open to uh, consultations from Europeans and other expats? Do you find them uh, much more... Uh, it's, again, yeah. it's early days yet. There yeah. are people that are other chambers that are trying to get his attention on certain mm -hmm. things. This was the, you know, the first one. I think well, it was very well received. Well, he had a crisis a few received. months ago, yeah. But um, early signs are, are, are good. Look good, yeah. But good. we need that sort of to mature into positive actions that uh, we can all see. We should get our hands on that document, Aaron Carter, very soon. Maybe you can help us bring it to expert insights, yeah. All right, so, uh, so Keith Perrin, now what does the future hold for you? here in the Philippines. Do you plan ever to go back to your country or this is it, this is going to be the last country yeah. you live in? I, I, I family take the mickey out of me because I'm a bore, uh, the fun, make fun of me they, yeah. um, because i boring engineer at heart so when I left Shell... Engineers are not boring, I'm an engineer, <laughs> I don't say that. Um, I wrote my own personal business plan Okay, okay, this is okay. Keith Perrin Enterprises now. Yeah. What, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And what's mm -hmm. my objectives? And keep healthy and see family and all, all these things. Right. And start putting things to do under each yeah. of those consultancy works and social works, see yeah. families, uh, travel, do hobbies that I haven't neglected. So I've got all these things. And having, it's like a, have you seen the film Bucket List? Before you die, you right, want to do right. all these yeah, things. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so I'm s we're slowly working our way through that. Yeah. Um, and I've got some of the things going now, doing some consultancy work, doing chamber is, of commerce Is there work. anything in your bucket list that has been influenced by the Filipino culture and that you say that, I used to be English now and this is my Filipino part. Is there something that you want to share? Something that you've adopted the Filipino culture and say, I'm now so much Filipino. I think um, I'm getting involved 
and we'll do more in charity work here because there is the need is just so huge. Yeah. Which I would not have done so much in in UK because mm. the, the the need is is there, but it's nowhere nowhere near as big as this. Mm. Where I have <laughs> tried to get involved in the culture is my love of guitars and live bands, and the Filipinos are world class in that. So we spend many of our evenings if going around the bars here. If you don't sing, you're not a Filipino. You know that's <laughs> it. Yeah. I wouldn't say I'm a great singer, although uh, Vidioki was a revelation to me here, but trying to play guitar. One of my mm. ambitions was, was always to play in a bar here in mm. my own right, rather than just because I was the boss of a company that used to have put on gigs uh, that I could perform in. But I, I love live music. I'll happily sit on my own just watching a guitarist all night. Like so I said, and watch that cricket. in your bucket list. To it's, in, it's in there, but it's, I haven't got around to it yet. But um, Is there something that you as an Englishman, as with your experiences in the oil and gas industry or your global experiences that you'd like to impart to the Filipino culture or to the Filipino people and say, hey, I've been around and I've lived this life and here's something I want to share with you to make you a better you. Is there something that you can give us? All I can go back to is to believe in yourself mm -hmm. because I find Filipinos so respectful and so quiet and so timid in, in the presence of foreigners particularly. Yeah. Yeah. And Part of my role in Shell was to bring these these guys and girls Power out them up a bit, okay. and let them. R and I, I love nothing more than to see a talent shine that was dim before, yeah, mm -hmm. not dim in a bad way, but you know the, the light wasn't shining, and somehow we've done something to make this light shine. And um, and we do that by bringing the hierarchies down and stop thinking that I'm the boss, so I can't speak all the time. The boss is there, and. So the, the young graduates that we used to employ, some of the best graduates in Shell, mm -hmm. have got that. I mean, they, they may, they, they take off once they're given this opportunity because they have the innate talents. That all they need is the confidence. Um, but I, I, one little story, one of the young graduates that came to work for me in Shell. In Palawan? In, yeah. in the Alampaya. Um, he was doing fantastic work. He was doing things well beyond his years. Right, right. But he would always, when he wanted to see me, um, look around the door and, and then sh He'd bow down a bit. And then come back again. I said, look, come in, come in. If you've got yeah, a problem, yeah, I've yeah, got a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when I gave him some feedback, look, you're doing a great job, but just be a bit more upfront and talk to me. Yeah. Um, I won't bite your head off. You know? yes. I want you to talk to me. Yeah. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, look, when you spent your whole life with your parents and your teachers telling you not to speak unless spoken to, Wow. How, how on earth can you expect me to, mm -hmm. to change that whole mentality just because you've told me to? So give me a break. <laughs> give me time to adapt. That was adapt. his point of view. Yeah. That was so point I said, of view. thank you. I understand you now. Give you yeah. a bit more time. And uh, now it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, so to that little timid attitude, there's a pro and a con. The pro is that it makes them more caring. It makes them more polite. Mm -hmm. And yet the con is that maybe there are times that a Filipino or a guy like that should stand up and speak. So mm -hmm. that's a rephrase for what you said. Yeah. All right, sir. So, Keith, it's been a pleasure having you here at Expat too. Insights. And thank you for your insights on energy and the English yep. and the Filipino people. Now, if there's anything you want to say to your community, to the British Nationals or to the British Chamber of Commerce, the camera is yours for the next 60 seconds. Okay, just right uh, maybe a couple of things. Um, I was fascinated to find the English um, culture documented. There's a fantastic book called The English by Jeremy Paxman, which I got a lot of this information from. Yeah. I recommend that to any English readers who want to understand their roots and how, why they behave they do, where they do. Um, and as far as the British Chamber of Commerce is concerned, if you've been inspired at all by anything I've said and you want to come and join us, we have an active program kicking off very soon now. Get in touch with me through bccphil.com website or directly. So uh, we look forward to meeting you. You want to say that again, they'll just put it on, on okay. they'll put it up on the, the website. www dot bccphil dot com or bccphil bccphil dot com all right um, and we we'll welcome you uh, with open arms and come to any of our functions and uh, meet me in person if you wish thank you so uh, is there any other way to say thank you in English other than thank you ta, <laughs> just just ta, thank you great mate thanks <laughs> all right salamat <laughs> and thank you Paul thank you Paul thank you all right much. bye bye so that was Sir Keith Perrin of the British Chamber of Commerce and he is an Englishman, also a British national. Next week on this show we have the Indian Ambassador Yogendra Kumar just before the Indian Republic Day. So thank you for watching Expat Insights. I'm your host Raju Mandian. Salamat and Mabuhan.